o'clock on the dot, um, eight o'clock in Montana. So um, welcome to everybody. And um, Mutama, I think let's go over to you to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you very much, uh, Fanus. And uh, thank you, especially to Sandy for joining us on an early morning before breakfast so that uh, you can uh, be in an African uh, time frame. And especially for this webinar, which is hosted uh, thankfully by Fabi, we are very thankful for that opportunity. We are also thankful that uh, the Southern African Society for Standard Biology could continue activities during this disruptive period and to allow us as a community to get together. And especially, uh, today's speaker was one who was to be a plenary had we succeeded to hold our SSSB meeting last year. So thank you very much, Sandy. But before I introduce Sandy, let me get some announcements. We'll have another webinar on the 2nd of September where the plenary is Isabel uh, San Martin. And it will be followed by a one day online workshop on Bayesian methods in biogeography on the 3rd of September. Please see details on the uh, FABI uh, page or the SSB page. For today's webinar, uh, people are welcome to post questions or comments in the chat box. And after Sunday's uh, presentation, we'll have some, a couple of more minutes for how to respond to any burning question. And that uh, today's presentation will be recorded and available on the SSB YouTube channel. So there will be an opportunity to get your question answered and for conversation, conversation to go on. Uh, the link uh, is be posted for the uh, YouTube channel there. But let me get to the speaker of today. You know, Sunday, South Africa this month is the Women's Month and we celebrate uh, the women uh, folk in our society. And we're great to have one of the world's leading female scientists one of the world's leading scientists who is female, let me rephrase myself. One of the people that is an a upcoming uh, systematist I looked up to, I like to go and listen to her talk, whose ideas are thought provoking, who has talked and walked the talk, especially in getting people included and in doing science as a community, as, a, as opposed to helicopter science, where people come from Europe to the rest of the world and go back without involving the people who live in those countries. Sunday is based at the Natural History Museum in London. For us taxonomic botanists, you know the BM, that institution that holds lots of South African collections, especially from about 1800. She's been uh, the leader of the algae, fungi and plants division, and now is doing other things. Sunday, for those who like, you know, numbers, you know, is one of those people with, you know, citations just around 21,000 you know, H index of nearly 60. So, but our work spans from species description, from forensics to big evolutionary questions. She's been part of initiatives that are global. And importantly, she's been in the key in the International Association for Plant Taxonomy, IAPT, where she is now serving at the post of past president, which means that she is one of the elders of the IAPT. And over the last 10 years, she's been chairing the nomenclature uh, committee, both at the Melbourne and the Shinsen meeting. So if you, those who cite the Shinsen code, you would cite Sunday's work. But above that, she's been recognized by the American Academy of Arts and Science as a fellow. She's a fellow of several other societies. So I could go on and on. But please, today's theme is Angus Farms Taxonomy and Evolution. We've got one of the top scientists to talk to us about Salanesi, more than uh, potatoes and tomatoes. Sandy, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Muthama. I mean, it's very, very kind of you to invite me and it's really nice, really, really great to be here. I'm gonna try to share my screen now, which is of course quite, um, it's a challenge. Te technology is not my best thing. So let's see if I can do this. Okay, is it shared? Can everybody it's see that? Thank you. Yes. Okay, I'm going to make it full screen now. Let's see if this works. Okay, perfect. Um, yes. First, first of all, I'd really like to thank you, Muthama, and you, Nicola, as well, for inviting me 
to, to participate in this webinar. It's, it's really great. I wish we were all together in South Africa, but we aren't. And this is the next best thing because it's really nice to be together and to be sharing information and to be sharing our experiences. And I'm really looking forward to kind of the conversation that we can have after the end of this. I'd also like to thank the IAPT for which as Muthama says, I'm the acting past president. Sadly, our past president uh, passed away, Vicky Funk passed away. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing the past president job. So it's sort of a bit of a, it, it's bittersweet being the past president of the IAPT. And because they were sponsoring our attendance at the meeting that was to be held last year to have a course in nomenclature, which both Nick Turland and I are developing to, to be able to deliver online. So maybe we can do that as a day workshop at some time in the future. So thank you so much for, for, um, for inviting me. So today, I'd just like to talk, take you through um, sort of like a whistle-stop tour of some of the work that I've done throughout my career on the Solanaceae, because one of the great things about working in plants is that, and working with plants that are important to people, like, like Solanaceae, which most people, particularly in Europe, know from tomatoes and potatoes, is that you run into all kinds of interesting questions, interesting interactions, and interesting evolutionary patterns. So just a quick introduction to Solanaceae in general. It's not a big family. It's not a huge family like the legumes, the orchids, or the composites. It's not one of those mega diverse families. It's pretty ordinary. It has about 103 genera, about 4,000 species. But what's peculiar about the family is that almost half of the species diversity within the family is contained in the single genus Solanum. And I'll tell you a bit more about Solanum later. So Solanum, Solanum with loads and loads of species, then a couple of other genera, which are mostly neotropical with about 200 going down to, and then there's a bunch of genera with a single, with a single species. And by far the biggest generic diversity is in South America. But Solanaceae occur in an enormously wide range of habitats. These, they occur in the driest deserts in the world. This is the Atacama Desert in Northern Peru. They occur in very, very high elevations. This is above 5,000 meters in, also in Peru. This is the homeland of many of the of wild potatoes. They occur in the big transvolcanic belts across, across, uh, across South America, both, in, both up and down in the Andes and across, this is the transvolcanic belt in Mexico. And they also occur, but their highest species diversity is in the rainforests on the Eastern slopes of the Andes. This is an area where um, more than a meter of rain falls every year. And these forests are incredibly rich in, in species of Solanaceae and also in other shrubby types of families. And we can talk about that a bit later. But they also, there's a huge diversity of Solanaceae as well in the savannas of Africa. And I'll talk a bit about that later. And also in the dry central areas of Australia. So Solanaceae are worldwide, mostly in tropical areas, but they extend far into temperate areas as well. So they really are a family that has global distribution. So with them, we can look at global patterns, which is super interesting. So in terms of body size, and we, we often don't think of plants as having bodies, but they do. So in terms of body size, most Solanaceae are understory forest shrubs. This is a new species of the genus Bromfelsia from Bahia in Brazil. These occur in these dense forest understories, really shady environments. But they also can be tiny little um, herbs. These, these, these things down in the, in the front in the middle right here are actually Camiseraca villosa, which is, which is one of the Solanaceae, which occurs in the dry, arid areas of the southwestern United States. And they can also be large trees. This is a large tree of Solanum denikensi, which is in Marsabit in Kenya. So they have a huge range of different habitats they live in, but they also live in, they also have a huge range of different types of body shapes. Now, the work that I've done throughout my career that Mathama very kindly described as world breaking, but I think of as being rather ordinary and, and, and but quite fun, because I've spent my entire career trying to have a good time and I've managed it, which is a huge success, is I've divided this, I've, I've thought about doing my work in two different ways. One of which is what one might distinguish as taxonomy, is working out what species are and what groups are and how to recognize them. And I can take from this something that was said by the great Swedish botanist Linnaeus, um, that if you don't know the names of things, the knowledge of them is lost too. So naming things can be incredibly important. As we all know recently in a lot of the discussions about the names of organisms, names are very, very important and names and names convey a lot. But names are also important for another reason, that they allow us to link information back to a central source. But the second plank of my work, which is, um, 
which is, is phylogenetics. And this is a phylogeny which we published in 2013, the first dated phylogeny that had more than a thousand tips in it, and everybody's doing them now, so that's all fine. But, um, and these connect, the yellow arrows connect and the blue arrows connect. And this is a phylogeny of Solanaceae, which we put a few kind of um, flowers and fruits against. And with this phylogeny, we've been looking at evolutionary patterns within, within the entire family, but also within the large genus Selenum. This red circle is around the whole of the large genus Selenum, which is, again, remember I said earlier, is half the species diversity of the family Solanaceae. So the taxonomic work we do allows us to define the tips and, I le and look at what the tips are, but the phylogenetic work allows us to look at the patterns amongst those tips and think about evolution, biogeography, and all of the other really interesting things that you can do with a phylogeny. So looking at across the Solanaceae, just so you get a kind of picture of how amazing they are, I'll just take you on a quick whistle stop tour through some of the amazing floral diversity and, and body diversity in the family. This is Cyzanthus, which was for a long time thought by um, people like Joseph Dalton Hooker and those at Kew to be a member of the Scrofulariaceae, old style Scrofulariaceae, and, um, but is actually a very good member of the Solanaceae. It's very zygomorphic flowers and looks nothing like what you would imagine the Solanaceae would look like. Petunias are also important members of the Solanaceae, not only because they're interesting in being highly diverse in Southern South America, so are probably a very ancient lineage, but they've also been important in elucidating um, basic cellular mechanisms like small RNAs. So small RNAs were first discovered in petunia, in petunia flowers where they would silence the anthocyanin producing genes, creating these kind of mosaic patterns in the flowers in petunia. The Nobel Prize, of course, for discovering microRNAs, which is what they're called in, um, in animals, went to someone working in animals as opposed to someone working in plants, which is often the case. Those Solanaceae that occur in the temperate zones in Europe are all incredibly poisonous. They all have high contents of what are called tropane alkaloids, which are alkaloids which cause um, disruption to the synapses in your brain and cause hallucinations. One of these is Atropa belladonna, which is the deadly nightshade. And people often call all Solanaceae deadly nightshades, but actually only a few of them are, have, this, have these, these deadly tropane alkaloids. They have really these strange blackish flowers. They look nasty. And they're the part of the, of the tradition of witchcraft within, within Europe. And this is in, in part why when Solanaceae were first brought as potatoes and tomatoes from South America to Europe, that they were viewed with a certain amount of suspicion. Because Solanaceae were associated with the practices of witchcraft. And we know this because um, de Laguna, who was a Spanish, a Spanish um, humanist priest, was a priest, decided to do an experiment with witches, people who had been um, con convicted of witchcraft. And he locked them in a house and asked them what they did done the night before. And witches were well known to fly in the silence of the dead of night throughout, throughout, throughout everywhere doing terrible things. And he locked them in the house, posted guards all around the house. And in the morning he said, what did you do? And they said, we flew all around the countryside doing all this stuff. And he said, no, you didn't, you were in the house. And he found a pot of a certain green ointment, which was composed of herbs such as henbane, nightshade, and mandrake. So these Solanaceae were really, really involved in, in, in practices in this whole thing about witchcraft, which is witchcraft is really about um, suppressing people who you don't like in communities. So, but it was drug addiction as opposed to anything more sinister. And mandrakes are a, are a fascinating plant. They have an incredibly interesting history. And any child who you talk to today knows about mandrakes and knows that you have to put on earmuffs when you harvest them. And that's because of Harry Potter. So she got the botany of that right, because in the Middle Ages, people felt that if you pulled a mandrake out, it would scream and you would die. And this was in a way, a way to keep, keep the mandrake industry going. But probably the solanaceous drug that most people use, that is the most used, not most people use, but most is the most used is tobacco. And tobacco after alcohol is the single biggest abused drug by human beings. And Nicotiana tobacco has nicotine in it. And nicotine is one of these tropane alkaloids. And you can see the kind of the structure, this is the structure of nicotine, but all tropane, tropane alkaloids basically have the same structure. Now, tobacco is actually indigenous to the Andes. It is, um, 
it's not really known from the wild. This, this young man is Moises Mendoza, and this is a picture taken in 2000 when we were looking for wild populations of Nicotiana in the Andes. And this is a, a, a plant we collected, which turns out to be really interesting from the point of view of its cytology. And the reason that we were looking for tobaccos and look, studying the cytology is because tobaccos are what are known as allopolyploids. So tobaccos are the combination of two genomes put together to make one that is double, that is double the, the chromosome number. And you can see with these flowers of the two putative, the two um, progenitors or current descendants of the progenitors of, of Nicotiana tobacco, that it does look a bit like a hybrid between these two flowers. And you can see that as well when you look at the, at the chromosome, at chromosome staining. And this work was done with Andrew Leach and, and Jung Lim. And you can see here the Nicotiana sylvestris, the, the maternal parent, chromosomes died in, in yellow, and Nicotiana tomentosiformis, the paternal chromosomes died in red. And you can see that in tobacco, both those sets of chromosomes are there, but they're actually starting to mix up. And one of the reasons that we've been interested in studying tobacco, Nicotiana, is because this mixing up, this diploidization of these polyploid species happens relatively quickly. There are some polyploids, tobacco itself is less than 200,000 years old as a, as a polyploid, but there are some lineages of polyploids in tobacco, in tobaccos, um, which are 10 million years old, and those you can no longer see the two progenitor genomes in this, in this way when you paint the chromosomes. So it's a kind of model system in which to look at how diploidization happens and how the process of polyploidy can lead to diversity. So I want to shift now to talking about selenium, which is really, really my, my great love is the genus selenium. This is selenium whale and I described by Michael Neat from Bolivia. Now, selenium is one of the largest genera. It's one of the top 10 or 15 angiosperm genera, which have more than a thousand species. These, these genera are, are fascinating. Why do they have so many species? And we'll come on to that a bit, a bit later. But selenium has always been a big genus. It was large in Linnaeus species Plantarum. There were 23 species and it has grown over the years. And the biggest growth came here between in the, in the, in the first half of the, of the 19th century. And that was really because that was when the great explorations and collections started to happen in South America, which is, as, we, as I said earlier, is where the really big species diversity in selenum is. And, and we think there are probably about 1500 species of selenum, you know, all said and done when it, when it comes to the end because we're still actively describing. But one of the problems in, this, in working with these very big genera, and in particular in genera in which there are plants of economic importance, is synonymy. So synonymy and working out what the species are and where the names are, are applied and what names apply to the same thing can be a huge challenge. And in Selenum, we have now about 1,240 something species. There are 6,168 names, which means that there's 80% synonymy. So that's higher than the synonymy across the board in angiosperms. But this is often due to either widespread species, which I'll talk about in a bit, or to cultivated species, which people have described varieties and, and um, as different species throughout history. Um, when it, they shouldn't have been done in a botanical way, it should have been done as in the, using the cultivated code of plants, which if I come and give the course, you'll hear all about. So selenums are pretty easy. I mean, selenums are very easy to recognize. You can teach someone to recognize a selenum at five paces because they all have basically the same flower floral plan, you know, five-parted starry shaped corolla with the anthers held in the middle, often held in a cone. But there are subtle differences amongst this flora morphology, which have, allowed, which have made people describe these things as different genera. So they've segregated out various bits which look a bit different, like Siphomandra, which has um, oil on the connectives, Lycopersicon, the tomatoes, which have a sort of beak, Normania and Triguira, which are, are um, Southern European uh, Atlantic islands, and Androceros, which have these different, different shaped anthers. So all of these genera had been separated out of selenum. But when we first started to do molecular phylogenies in the early part of the 2000s, we saw that all of these, all of this apparent floral morphology difference, which defined genera, actually did not. That selenum itself was a monophyletic group with 100% support, and that things like the, the tomatoes fell well within selenum, as did the siphomandras, as did the androceros, as did the normanias. So all those things that people had segregated out as, se as separate genera 
in selenium, we then put back into selenium, which made selenium a bit bigger, not a huge amount bigger, but it made the diversity more. That was somewhat controversial, particularly with the, with the cultivated tomato, but you'll notice now that all of the tomato literature cites the tomato as selenium lipopersicum L, which is how it was originally described by, by Linnaeus. So molecular phylogeny really allowed us to, to define selenium in a very unambiguous kind of way. But, but you know, how to, how to define a genus? Defining a genus is actually a matter of where you cut your tree. So you could define selenium as a monophyletic selenium as we did by cutting it down here and including all these different clades. Or if we had wanted to, we could have cut it here and defined each of these things as a separate genus, which means we would have had a whole bunch of new generic names, some of which we would have had to invent. Um, and, and it would be very difficult to tell these apart, these, these other genera. So we decided to recognize a monophyletic selenum that had all these different clades in it. One of the other reasons for not cutting selenum, oops, um, for not cutting selenum at that, at that big fat red line is that the relationships between all of those major clades in the monophyletic selenum were not at all clear in the early part of the 2000s. So, you know, it could be that the Normania clade and the African non-spiny clade we're actually each other's closest relative and should not be two genera, but should be one if we cut it at the red line. So we decided to do it in that particular way. And that turns out to have been a very good decision because a lot of work that we've done subsequently, and this is a paper which Edeline Gagnon is leading um, out of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Edinburgh, is, is that looking at selenium with lots of different molecular data sets, we find that the clades themselves, those same things that we recognized earlier, those same, those same clades that we recognized a long time ago are very, oops, are very, very stable, but actually the relationships between them are not that stable. So deciding to recognize a monophyletic selenium was actually a very good idea. And we think in selenium that these polytomies that we see, which are marked by the red arrows here in this cladogram on the right, which is um, the cladogram of, um, of the of target capture phylogeny. So this is this is um, a, a super matrix cladogram. This is based on um, on um, the plastome phylogeny, and this is done with target capture of nuclear genes. Is that these polytomies that we see are actually hard polytomies, and they're telling us something about evolution. We're not quite sure yet whether they're telling us about incomplete lineage sorting, whether they're telling us about ancient hybridization, or what is happening, but that these polytomies are not necessarily resolvable. And that's something that I think we need to really think about carefully when looking down at downstream analyses of macroevolution, which I'll talk about in a minute, and, um, and other things, is that is that evolutionary patterns are not necessarily dichotomous, always dichotomous. So developing models that allow us to look at non-dichotomous patterns is going to be really important in the future because most of the pattern, most of the models that we use to analyze macroevolution and macroecology actually depend upon having a, a, a dichotomous phylogeny. So we, we're thinking about these hard polytomies now and looking at, looking at those areas of the tree and looking at um, adding taxa, but also adding sequence to see what we can find. So selenium itself is also like the Solanaceae, hugely diverse. It has tiny, tiny individuals. This is my thumb holding a plant from the high elevations in Argentina, which is doing its thing of having a bud, a flower and a fruit and it's live fast, die young. This is a very, very small plant to being large trees. This is the wolf fruit, Selenum lycocarpum from, from Eastern Brazil, which is a large tree with extremely large fruits. And these large fruits are actually eaten by Amazonian wolves, which are themselves an endangered species um, and used as a vermifuge. And um, so there's, there's evidence that they, they eat these at a particular time of the year and that, and that the chemical compounds in the fruits kill worms and that the, the wolves are, are using these in that particular way, which is pretty cool. So looking at, I've always been interested in where things grow and where, where um, in, in biogeography is, is because a lot of times biogeog biogeography can tell you a lot about the evolutionary patterns within a family. So this is that super matrix phylogeny of selenum. And you can see that it's divided essentially into two big parts. There's a big grade here below the yellow star, which are we call the non-spiny selenums. And so those are things like potatoes and tomatoes and um, uh, Jerusalem cherries, various things without spines. 
Everything above the star, which is a monophyletic clade, are the spiny selenums, and they're characterized by having these epidermal, epidermal prickles. We call them spines. They're technically not spines. They're prickles. But these epidermal prickles, and they also have um, particular types of anthropomorphology. So that's a really good monophyletic clade, and it's been a strong, strongly supported, very clear monophyletic clade since the very beginning of our looking at molecular phylogeny in selenum, and has been a long recognized recognized group. So I just want to draw your attention to, I've, I've done a very kind of, um, a very childish sort of um, look at the biogeography of selenum. And the blue circles are things that are clades which are concentrated in the North Central Andes. The green circles are things which are concentrated in the Southern Cone, meaning that, that narrow, that Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, that Southern part of South America. Yellow is Mexico, red is Brazil. And the bright, big brown circle I want to draw your attention to. So you can see, you know, they're all over South America. So clades, clades diversify in all kinds of different places. There's not really a pattern of South to North or, or whatever. But I want to draw your attention to this big brown circle, which is um, Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, and Oceania. So what people call the old world. And I kind of am a bit ambiguous about the old world. So I'd really appreciate anybody's suggestions of a better way to talk about Africa, Asia, Australia, Eurasia, Europe, and Oceania. So I'm calling it a triple AEO, that part that's not the Americas. And you can see that this is really unusual in Selenum because all of these other geographic areas are all mixed up. But this one big monophyletic clade of spiny Selenums is completely confined, is completely outside of the Americas. So that to us was rather interesting, given that most of the species diversity within Selenum is in the Americas. So with a PhD student and uh, my colleague, Andy Purvis, we decided to look at diversification dynamics in selenium. So what we did is we used the 2013 phylogeny that Tina Sarkinen led. We used something called pastis, which meant we added all of the species of selenium that weren't in the molecular phylogeny to the phylogeny to create an all species phylogeny because you can get huge bias if you only use the things that have a molecular sequence. For example, in selenium, we knew the molecular sequence for all of the potatoes, but none of a particular other clay. And then we used BAM and TREPAR to kind of analyze this. And you can see here that in this, in this um, diagram that um, sort of normal diversification rates are blue, slightly higher are green, and that's the potatoes, which are this high Andean clay. But the really high diversification rates in selenum are in this clay, which occurs outside of the Americas. So that to us was really very interesting. Because what, what it showed us was that the net diversification rate within this big genus was actually the mirror image of the species richness. One might expect that the diversification was the, was the fastest and going on in the area where there were the most species, but that was not the case for selenium. You can see that here in these two maps. This is the species richness map of selenium where it's really highly diverse in the Andes and in southern southeastern Brazil, but the net diversification the highest net diversification is in this, this clade in outside of the Americas, in at, mostly in Africa and Australia. So that to us was a really big surprise. And actually, this we could see that this was happening in a in a in a in a biogeographic and temporal context through the fact that there were two clades of selenum which were um, out which were which had emigrated to Australia. And the same is true for Africa. Is Archisalanum, which is one of these early branching lineages in, in the family, is only found in the moister parts of Southern Australia and in New Guinea. So it was probably widespread and was an early migration to Australia. Whereas these rapidly diversifying non-American spiny lineages are actually found throughout the arid interior of Australia. And so that tells us something about the timing of this of this um, of this migration that it that the diversification, the the timing of the migration happened about the Miocene, which is when both Africa and Australia were starting to aridify and the dry habitats were um, were increasing. So it turns out that this study told us that it's really important to look at something without these preconceptions, but also that 
these plants were in the right place at the right time with the right traits because the sister group of all of those spiny old world selenums is the selenum eliagnifolium clade. Now I know selenum eliagnifolium is a noxious weed in South Africa, but it's actually a very small clade of about five species which have rhizomes, which occur in arid areas. So that sister group relationship tells us that those traits went with these selenums to outside of the Americas and may have assisted in their diversification in those new areas. So sticking with these spiny selenums, which I think are absolutely amazing, they're terrible to collect, but they're absolutely fantastic plants, is um, I want to talk a bit about, about, about cultivated plants because one of the things that, that I've discovered in working in Solanaceae is that taxonomists like us tend to shy away from anything that has a cultivated plant in it because first of all, the nomenclature is a nightmare. Second of all, human intervention in, in modifying morphological diversity can cause a huge nightmares in terms of thinking about species. And second of all, they're just really complicated. They're really complicated, but actually they have lots of upsides because you get to you get to interact with lots of really interesting people if you call if you study cultivated plants. So I want to tell you a little bit about the eggplant, the brinjal eggplant, Selena melongina. Now this is a worldwide crop. It's um, probably originated in Asia, and what it does is take advantage of a particular morphological characteristic of so, of spiny of spiny selenums, which is called Andromonisi. And this, this um, breeding system, in this breeding system, there's a single hermaphroditic flower at the base of the inflorescence, and all the rest of the flowers in the inflorescence are, are, may, are functionally male. They, they never develop fruits. So you get, these, you get these species with large, single large fruits uh, from an inflorescence of many flowers. And we, as human beings, have taken advantage of that characteristic and turned the eggplant into this extraordinary crop, which has huge diversity. This is a market of eggplants in Hainan Island in China. So Selena melongina is, is a crop worldwide, and its, its origins and its morphology and its taxonomy have been very unclear for a long time. So we decided to start to work on these. There's a lot of diversity within Asia, within China alone. There are 2,000 named varieties of the of the um, of Selena melongina of the brinjal eggplant, and in India there are a number of different varieties as well. So what we decided to do as part of a big project that was to look at um, that was led by Maria Vorontsova, who you can see here hiding behind a selenum in her plastic bag in the picture, is to look at the. Um, we looked at the phylogenetics of the old world spiny clade. She, she did a monograph of the African species of spiny selenums, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. But um, we decided to look at the, at the phylogeny of this to identify um, germplasm for, for plant breeders. So this is a project we did in conjunction with eggplant breeders and the Global Crop Diversity Trust to look at what was the status, how could we look at something in a huge genus and divide this into germplasm gene pools in order to kind of guide plant breeding into the future to help mitigate against climate change. Because as climate change is, is, is happening, and it's happening here where I am in Montana, the whole Western United States is on fire. It's been more than 30 degrees every single day that I've been here, which is very unusual for this part of the US. That, that we know climate change is happening and thinking about our crops and thinking about wild diversity to help with that challenge is really important. So what we did is we took the phylogeny of these spiny African selenums and we looked at defining gene pools in order to kind of guide plant breeding. So I want to talk about gene pool one, which was selenum melongina plus selenum insanum, which is its wild relative. We also thought that it was important to think about um, these new world taxa of spiny selenums because one of the interesting things about selenums is that you can cross a lot of them. You can cross a lot of these things between clades. Crossability is not, crossability is a plesiomorphic character. So it's actually not something that we can really use to say whether something is, is related or not. Crossability is something that just happens often. So we decided to use these new world taxa and to use, and to use weeds because weeds were something that, that um, weeds have a lot of things that we'd like to have in our crops, the ability to resist pests, the ability to, to kind of cope with huge numbers of biotic factors and abiotic factors. So, so weeds, are, weeds are good. Weeds are bad, but weeds are good. 
So what we did is we compared germplasm collections of all eggplant wild relatives with our herbarium specimens that were done for these, these, these monographic works. And then we used gap analysis methods to, um, to compare data sets for sampling, for distribution, and for ecology. And what we found, it, to, to make it kind of the, the long story short, is that there were huge gaps in eggplant germplasm. Is basically there, there was no good eggplant germplasm for eggplant breeders to look at with respect to breeding for climate change. And a lot of this, a lot of these gaps occurred in African species, which are very closely related to the eggplant itself. And you can see there's the, all these all these gaps or these these um, orange spaces, and we also looked at collect because this was so though this was done in order to guide collecting priorities in a project that was done between the Global Crop Diversity Trust and the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. And so if you looked at collecting priorities, all spe all of the species, the collecting priorities you can see the high priorities are here areas here in Kenya and areas here in Tanzania, and then if you looked at the threatened species, then you can also see that those those also are. Um, are in Kenya and Tanzania. But what's really interesting is that the protected area network is in hatched on this map. And all of the collecting priorities for these threatened species were outside of protected areas. So actually these were very, very high priority to get into germplasm collections. So eggplant breeders could, could use this, could, could improve this really important crop. Now, the reason eggplants are important is because they have very high antioxidant content and are very, very nutrition, very, very nutritious. So, um, so that was an important collecting priority. Now, one of the, th one of the reasons there may be these gaps in collection is because a lot of these species are apparently somewhat weedy and they grow along roadsides. This is Selenum campylocanthum in Tanzania growing along, along a roadside. And people often don't collect plants that grow along roadsides. So these, so these really important wild relatives of a very important crop are often not collected because they're considered to be weeds. Now, one of the other things that we did with eggplants is to look at, at um, where eggplants came from and to think about, think about eggplants. And this is a, 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 from a paper in 2001 by, by um, Downey, Lester, and Anno. And what they, what they hypothesized is that ancestral ecotypes, which they called Selenum in Canum, and this is where the taxonomy came in, is we worked out the species level taxonomy of this group, which was hugely complicated. They said that they came from here, came over and became eggplants in, in cultivated ecotypes in Asia. And then something was going on in Africa, that this went you know, A, B, C, D up to here, and then it went over here. So it was an out of Africa type of hypothesis. And we, tried, we, we, we tested that using molecular phylogenetics, using whole chlor chloroplast genomes from, from the eggplant clade. And this is work that was led by Aubrey, um, uh, Xavier Aubrier, who is now at the Université de Paris Sud and is still working with eggplants and eggplant phylogeny. So we discovered a very similar pattern, but that was a bit more complicated. And what was more interesting is it was very complicated within Africa. Africa itself is hugely important to the evolution of these eggplant wild relatives. And this evolution has gone on within the continent of Africa, completely apart from the evolution of the eggplant itself. So here we have the eggplant clade, right here with the little eggplant showing it. And we have a whole set of African species here, Selenum lancei, Usambarensi, Agnuiorum, which are, which are things from Tanz Tanzania, Kenya, and Lancei is from Mozambique. And then you have a split, which has the Asian Melongina and Insanum, Selenum Insanum, and then another African radiation. So the out of Africa hypothesis for eggplants is correct, but is much more complicated than was previously thought. And we've got these various clades one can identify within the eggplants, one of which we've called the widespread clade, which is, um, which is these plants, these rigidum in canum, in canum cerestiforum, campylocanthum, Selenum umtuma, which is a South African endemic, Lichtensteinii, South African, Linneanum, which is South African and probably has also been taken to Northern Africa and the Mediterranean. But this widespread clade is all over in Africa. So what was going on there? And one of the things that Xavier and Sven Berkey were looking at was Selenum campylocanthum, which is one of those things that I call the world's most common plant. This plant occurs everywhere. Again, like those species in Australia, it's rhizomatous, it forms large clones and, and is in disturbed habitats everywhere. It's often not eaten by cattle, but actually is eaten by other animals. And so what Xavier and Sven did is they looked at the distribution of the species in these widespread clades and correlated that with the, with the distributions 
the um, known previous distributions of African elephants and impalas, all of whom are known to eat the fruits of these species. And these, and these, these distributions actually correspond to these large migratory patterns down the western part of Africa with these two species. And if you want to look at a YouTube video of impalas eating Solanum campylocanthum fruits, um, you can look at this. There's this. This link is here, and it'll be on the it'll be on the YouTube YouTube um, channel link as well. And this is work that's done by Rob Pringle, who's shown that these impalas and elephants eat these fruits all along their migratory paths. And I'm sure they're spreading these and complicating the taxonomy of these of these plants as they go. They're hideously variable. They've been given their uh, Selenium campylocanthum itself has something like 80 to 100 synonyms. So they're very, very variable because they're clonal, but they're also widely distributed because they're eaten by animals. So looking at those, looking at those endangered animals and these widespread, very common weedy plants actually seems like something perhaps not very intuitive, but is, is really important for both probably the, the, um, the future of elephants and impalas, but also for the future evolution of these plants as impalas and elephants become rarer. So all of this work depends upon herbaria. All of this work depends upon looking at herbaria, not just in places like the Natural History Museum in Kew, but in local herbaria throughout the distribution range of all of the species that we've been working on. This is Eric Tepe working in the herbarium in Dar es Salaam. And it's been really important to understanding the distributions of all of these taxa. It's also been important to work in the field. And what I think is wonderful about working in the field is that you meet fantastic people like Frank. So there are two other eggplant species which occur in Africa, one of which is Selenum macrocarpa and the other of which is Selenum um, ethiopicum. And the goma eggplant and the, and the scarlet eggplant, both are really important local fruits, but they're falling out of, out of use with the globalization of diets. And I think these will be really important things to be working on in Africa. There's a group working on sequencing the genome of Selenum ethiopicum in Kenya. But looking at these, at these taxa and also at their evolutionary patterns in relation to human migration, human selection will be really interesting in the future. There's been some work done, but not enough as far as I'm concerned, because they're really important parts of, of local culture. So looking at those tomatoes, and here's a few more tomatoes, I want us to focus on another group which is important in Africa and is something that's falling, fallen out of use but is now becoming of more interest to people. And these are the black nightshades, the moreloid clay, the Selenum nigrum group. Again, these are globally distributed. They have complicated polyploides, and this is work that's being led by Tina Sarkinen at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Edinburgh. And we started out by doing um, a phylogeny of, the, of this group just to see what was happening. And also then what we what we're doing is monographing each of these groups and we're monographing them by by geographic region because these plants are really complicated they're the ones that that have killed several selenum taxonomists in the past and fortunately we've survived so far and we're on the last we're on the last step. But you can see that there's a, a clinentire clade here, which is only in Africa and these are all polyploids so where their origins are is is quite difficult. To, we were not able to kind of um, discern those in the same way that we've been able to do with the, with the tobaccos, but, but we're working on it. So watch this space. So these plants are, as I said, globally distributed. They're like all selenums, their center of diversity is in South America, but they are, they have tiny little flowers. This is the, the flower of Selenum americanum and the anthers are less than a millimeter long. So people collect these all over the place because they're weedy, weedy herbs and they call them all Selenum nigrum but there are lots and lots of different species. And you can, you can figure out how to tell them apart with a bit of work. A lot of it has to do with fruit. This is Selenum memphiticum, which has green fruits with long calyx lobes. Here's Selenum americanum, which has shiny black fruits with these upturned calyx lobes. And one of the things they have, which is unusual in, in Selenum, is they have these stone cells or sclerified bodies within the fruits. We don't know what these are for, but they seem to kind of be very consistent within species most of the time. So we're using a lot of those types of characters to identify these species in the group. Now in Africa, these plants are used over almost the entire continent. In South Africa, as all of you I'm sure know, Selenum retroflexum is used to make jam. 
um, selenium tardi remotum is eaten by is eaten by eaten by people, um, as is selenium scabrum, which has a two varieties, two versions of selenium scabrum. One of which is cultivated for its for its fruits and has big fruits. The other of which is cultivated for its leaves and has big leaves. This is Manoko, our Tanzanian colleague, with whom we worked on these on these projects in Africa, and he's standing in a green in a greenhouse full of selenium selenium, the leafy version of selenium scabrum. And then Selenum villosum, which also occurs in the southern in the southern um, Mediterranean, has a has a bunch of different varieties within Kenya, which have very very highly elaborated inflorescences and have these orange fruits, which are which are eaten by people, and they're fantastic. Um, some of them taste like taste to me like wild strawberries. And this is Selenum umalilaensi, which is which Monoko described from a couple of populations at the border of Zambia and, and um, Tanzania that that. Uh, that is also cultivated by people and may actually be a cultigen, may be something that is just known from cultivation, but we we found it a couple of other places. So these are the African species. And in trying to figure these out, because there's been such a kind of imprint of human selection across these species in Africa for a long time, and because they're polyploid and therefore sometimes have higher variability, what we did is in a common garden experiment, what well, was an experiment, we just grew out all the accessions that we had from all over, Africa in a common garden in the Netherlands. And this is Tina and Gerard van der Verden and Peter Poxai, who also worked on this project. And then we collected those and looked at the variation in them. And there we, we, we verified various characters that we'd seen from herbarium specimens, like these very large fruits with, with, um, with stubby little uh, pedicels and turn back uh, calices and selenum scabrum, looked at these different varieties of selenum villosum, which are from different parts of Kenya, where you get these very highly elaborated inflorescences, which led people to describe them as different species, and um, realized that they were all the same. And this is true of cultivated plants in general, is because of the human imprint of, of our fiddling around with them and, and basically bending them to what we want. They, they actually can, can change a lot and can look quite different to their wild progenitors or to wild populations of the same species. And this is happening across this wild night, this black nightshade group. And this is a, a woman who has begun to cu cultivate Selenum Americanum in Hainan in China. And so this is, this is something that I have, have, we've been trying to apply for money from the European Union to look at, is to look at incipient domestication and look at people's choices when they're beginning to domesticate plants. And one of the things that I find is really funny about studying these African these plants, particularly in Africa, was that you would find on herbarium labels, weed at edge of field. Whereas actually, if you talk to the person who had the field, that plant was probably cared for, looked after, and was something that they prized. So, 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 so looking at these can be quite, deciphering them can be difficult from herbarium specimens. And also children have a really large part to play in this because particularly in Selenum villosum in Kenya, it's children who select those different varieties that they think taste nice and then scatter the seeds and then, and then um, look at them in, in their particular way. So, so communities and talking to people about cultivated plants is really, really important. And I'm sure you all know that. So over the course of my career, what, what we've tried to do is to take phylogeny, take the phylogeny of this large genus Selenum, and the green blobs are the ones that we've got phylogenies and, and monographs of, to not just do the phylogenetics, but to actually produce the monographs which have the descriptions and have the distributions which allow, which are testable hypotheses for what a species actually is in what these tips actually are. To produce those monographs, we've also taken those monographs and put them all online on a website called Solanese eSource. And I'm continually trying to improve this. So if people go and look at it and they think it should be improved, please tell me, because it would be really great to know. And we've also recently um, produced multi-access keys to all of the clades of Selenum, which are there on Solanese eSource for people to use. Again, comments, very, very welcome, and have published as many keys as we can on, on that website. Not altogether, keying out 1,200 species can be pretty tricky, so you, geography is a really good way to start. So doing that has been this integrated way of looking at taxonomy, monography, and phylogenetics all together. And this is super important now because the evidence that we hold in these herbaria is really important to support the understanding of long-term change and conservation. So in this paper by Robbie Hart from the Missouri Botanical Garden, I, I use it all the time because I still think this quote, although it's old now, still holds true, is that strengthening specimen collection 
curation and availability is absolutely a priority. So not only do we need to collect things, we need to curate those collections so that they're accessible and, and available to people in the future and making that data available digitally, particularly now when we're not able to do the specimen collection in the way that we were able to before is really a priority. So, so I've had an amazing time studying selenium and partly it's because I decided to combine taxonomy and phylogeny to look at what things are and help people be able to identify them in the areas where they grow, but also to look at the phylogenetics and explore those evolutionary patterns, which are so interesting and um, lead us on to more questions. So I haven't figured out the central question that I started out my whole career with was why are there so many species of selenium? But I found out some amazing things on the way and have been able to work some with this amazing people. And I've been lucky to have been funded by all kinds of different institutions for all kinds of different work. People always say taxonomy is impossible to fund, but I think that's not true. You can still get funding for taxonomy. You just have to be a bit creative. But the most wonderful part about working on Solanaceae the, is the community of people with whom we work and the community of people that we can still stay in touch with now today, even in these days of pandemic. And also I'm really grateful to you all for letting me come and talk to you. And I'd be really happy to take any questions that you might have. So thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing now so I can see you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Sandy. That was really, really stimulating. I've enjoyed every bit. I've been taking my notes, thinking of those solanums that are called weeds, especially oh. in the savannas <laughs> of East Africa. And uh, some of those common things I'm now realizing are close to eggplant. Here, solanum in canum is my childhood equivalent of the cricket ball to throw yeah. at things. Okay, questions, I cannot see any question from the chat, but we, we are open to yeah. take questions. Anyone who has them? Hello, Raise uh, your hand. excuse me. Yeah. Hello, excuse me, am I audible? Yes. Yes, Ritesh, you can go uh, on. Yes, I am Ritesh from India. Hi, Ritesh. Hello, and uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. And I've learned a lot of things about solenum today, but I have a question regarding the habit of this solenum. In India and in Indian Himalaya, I have seen some tree solenum species, solenum verbus, verbus ifolium or something. It's a tree species mm -hmm. in Himalaya. Uh, so in your phylogenetic study, did you find any correlation between the habit? Like they start from herb, they are shrubs, and they're also tree species. So could you find any pattern in your phylogeny? Actually, that's something that Edeline is working on now. She's working on tuberization and the different types of, um, we're doing an analysis now of the phylogeny, but a lot of the tree species which are in the Himalayas are actually introduced from, from, um, from the new world. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so there are lots of trees. There are a lot of trees. So Denikensi is a tree. Um, the, the tree that people grow as a, as a I mean, I know because in the Himalayas, I've been in the Himalayas and have seen Selenum chrysotrichum, which is a tree, but that's actually an introduction from, from Central America. So it depends on what species it is, because phylogenetically, those species, even though they grow in, in the Himalayas, are going to be yeah. in the clade, which is, which, is new, which is a new world clade, a Central American clade. But yes, there, is, there, there seems to be um, some, there's phylogenetic single, signal in habit, yeah. But but it's yeah. not necessarily about uh, habitat. It's okay. more about phylogeny. So, for example, the potatoes are all herbs. The tomatoes are all herbs. Various yeah. clades are all shrubs and small trees. So so it's more about phylogeny than it is about 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 habit. Except okay. the things that are very high up in the Andes, for example, above five thousand meters, very very high. Those yeah. are all herbs. Oh yeah. Thank you so much, Sandy. You're welcome. Hope to see you someday in India. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda has a question. I can see a hand. <laughs> uh, Andy, uh, uh, with, a, with a dual professional, a couple in the house and two different offices, you've got Mike. Um, so I, I apologize. That's all right, I'll take Mike. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, just thanks for a, a fabulous, a really fabulous talk. Uh, I, I, I work on fungi, so a little bit outside the botany space, but but, but love plants and botany. And an issue that we we really battle with in terms of the microbes of, is the fact that there are so many that are unknown. Um, 
So you take this on an IC, how well is it sampled? You, you, you touched on the issue of the importance of collecting and sampling. So how well is it sampled? Um, how often are you finding new tech? Well, of course, what's a species that, you know, what's a species? Yeah, well, exactly, but yeah. on that, that, that issue, I think, you know, what I'm, I'm talking about, uh, generally, you know, good species, how often are you finding new tech? So how well is the world sampled? We find, I mean, on average, kind of the group of people working on selenium find, I don't know, five to 10 new ones a year. So it's not much. Flowering plants are very well known. Compared to fungi, we know everything. I mean, compared to fungi, we know everything about flowering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we still, do, we still do find new taxa. We still mm -hmm. find new taxa. And I think there's... Um, Really, I think there's one one group which is now being worked on by a Peruvian graduate student um, that Tina Sarkinen and I are sharing. She is in Peru now collecting, but there's one really gnar, what I call a gnarly group, you know, that we just don't understand the species in, and 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 that's and that's great. I mean, it doesn't. That's not to say that we've got a um, a perfect understanding of everything because I know there are areas in the genus where where I haven't done. A perfect well you never can do a perfect job can you so so my goal has been and i often have arguments with people about this actually so my goal has been to get everything up to a particular standard so that you get so you have kind of a modern treatment using the same species concepts throughout right. throughout the genus you know that we're all working to the same thing and then there are certain areas where and one of those is in south africa actually one of those is is so, so any south african students who want to work on selenium Yay, because there's a couple of species, Selenum humili and Selenum rubitorum, which I don't think we did a particularly good job on. We did as best as we could, but, but there's, more, there's more diversity in there and, and the patterns of diversity are very complicated and we don't really understand them well. And it's partly because when we were doing our project, we couldn't come to South Africa to do field work. Well, you're welcome anytime. We'll look after well, you. I really want to come, but but you know we do discover new species all the time. Yeah. And and the, the really the mother load for new species of selenium is, is the Andes and 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 um and Brazil. I mean Brazil mm. is full of weird and wonderful selenums that look unlike. I mean one we described, I described with a with a student Yuri Govea. Um, the other year looks like that wolf fruit thing with great big fruits, but that wolf fruit is a huge tree. And this is a thing that has, that has different hairs and different spines and everything, but, and it creeps along the ground. So it's got these kind of, so it looks, it's almost like Welwitchia, you know, it kind of goes along. So we <laughs> called it Selenum medusae <laughs> from Medusa. So, yeah, so there's lots of there and there are new taxa, but they're not, they're not like you get in the fungi where you have whole clades, which not one of them is named. Thanks so much, and um, thanks again. May I? Thanks. May so I? Daniel, Daniel's popped a question in the chat. So, uh, thank so you. is thank that you, Daniel? We'll, we'll take one more question, and then I'll encourage people to uh, put questions and you can respond to them so that we can move to the other uh, two Yes, two yeah, talks. I'm sorry, because I talked longer than I should have. May I ask a beautiful question? Yes. Uh, thanks, I'm Rian Stoss from the National Collection of Insects in South Africa. I study beetles, and uh, I've been considering uh, sampling widely and intensively the beetles, uh, the specific sort of beetles associated with Lonum and Slaci in Southern Africa. I can't quite hear you. Sorry, yes, my microphone is broken. Yeah, I can't quite, quite hear you, so shout at me. <laughs> I'll, I'll shout <laughs> gracefully. Um, we've, there's, there's in Africa this sort of beetle genus which is really pretty, and they feed on Solanum. Uh, the genus is aptly called Solanophila. And um, uh, we are considering a, an intensive survey of them on wild Solanums, but we are scared that the, the taxonomy of our Solanus here is not quite up to what we would need. Would you say that we will have a problem with identifying our Solanums or having them identified? Well, I mean, yeah, there are, slanums are quite difficult to identify. Yes. I mean, they're, well, they're not yes. that difficult. They're, they're difficult. But we, we've tried to make, so what I've tried to do is make all of the keys um, open access. So all mm. of these publications are open access so that the keys are there. Um, 
people still send me pictures of selenium all the time. And sometimes you can try to align the sequences and try to make the sequences match up. And, and I've, been, I've been in correspondence with somebody from South Africa talking about um, uh, selenium lichtensteinii versus campylacanthum and seraciformi and, you know, and, and sometimes the trouble is that, there, that, that the trouble with using sequences alone is that sometimes there's ancient hybridization or there's incomplete lineage sorting, which will come out. And if you have a single individual versus another, it's, it's quite, it can be quite difficult, but you can get things. I mean, getting things to a clade, actually from the point of view of, of herbivory is probably pretty important. That, that is probably sufficient. Um, if, yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a key to the clades. There's a key to the clades that's on wonderful. herbivory. I haven't investigated yeah. as much yet as the new idea, but the beetles are very pretty and there are potential future pets. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you. Sorry for shouting at you. Yeah, yeah. So well, that that would be yeah. So they are they are hard, but we're trying to make as many of the keys open. We're trying to make as much. Well, we are making the information open access because we think that's important. And there are descriptions on the website. There are descriptions and photographs of of species, which a lot of some some of which I've done, but a lot of which have been shared by people. Somebody's asked a question about a gap, a sampling gap in tropical and central Africa, and and yes, that is a place. And and there's a student Blaze who's been working in um, in um, in Belgium, who's just done his thesis on some selenums from from um, West and Central Africa. But but yes, there is there are big gaps because a lot of the collections are only old, and I think one of the things that's important about that is digitizing these European collections, are is is really important because a lot of that material never stayed in you know lamentably never stayed in Africa, and so digitizing all of those collections so that the variability because a lot of these species, especially the cultivated ones, are hugely variable, so it's hard to match them unless you have the whole range of variation. So having all of those the, all of those collections, not just the types, digitized is is really going to be important. Thank you so much, Sandy. I thank you, Mathama, and thank you, there. thank you so much for having me. And I, I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody else's talks. Thanks. Thank you. Stay on. People can still get to, get to you through the chat and uh, after the talk. And we look forward to having you in South Africa sometime. Thank you so much, Sandy. Okay, Nicola, you can take over now. Okay, great. Thanks, Mother Yes, and thanks very much, Sandy, for a great talk. And after the two um, student speakers, we can have an open forum and a general discussion if anyone wants to stay for that. Um, and now, I think, um, am I correct that Bianca is up first, Farnas? Is that? Is that um, yes, that's correct. Okay, so um, Bianca is, um, she's currently doing her MSc at WITS, working with Kelsey Glennon and Glennis Goodman Cron. Um, and her MSc is on population genetics and polyploidy and rhodohypoxis. But she's actually presenting work today that she did for her honors um, project. And that's looking at um, morphological and molecular analysis of the Senecio achillifolius complex. So we very much look forward to your talk. Bianca. And just a reminder, people can type questions in the chat and we'll have a few minutes after Bianca's talk before we go on to Fricky's for, for questions. All right, over to you, Bianca. Thanks so much. I'm just getting it up. Give me two seconds. Can you see which screen are you seeing? It looks like you're talking. Screen, it's fine. Yes, that looks good. Oh, was that fine? Sorry, it's not showing me what I'm showing. There we go. Okay, so you can see the cover slide and you can see it all. Yes. Okay, great. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining and I'm really excited to tell you what I did during my honors year last year. Um, we looked at a morphometric and molecular analysis of the Senecio uh, archilifolius complex. So Senecio sensu latur is a really large and polyphyletic genus. It comprises of about 1,250 species, and 350 of these species are found in Africa. So we looked at a species complex within Senecio. So there are three species within the Senecio sensu latur that require clearer delimitation because they are morphologically similar and may in fact be the same species. 
So the three species are Senecio seminivius, Senecio archilifolius, and Senecio tenacitopsis. So distinguishing features are largely lacking with many characteristics overlapping. But when they were first described by Hilliard, um, the following, uh, following distinguishing features were identified between the taxa. So Senecio seminivius is quite similar to Senecio tenacitopsis, but can be distinguished by its white woolly leaf buds where Senecio tenacitopsis has a grayness of all the leaves because it has indumentum covering all leaves, not just the leaf buds. And then Senecio arclifolius has glabrous leaves and stiff rod-like branches. But we see high morphological variation within species and even within single populations of a single species. So here we have a single population of Senecio seminivius in Lesotho and we can see there's quite a lot of morphological variation, especially in the leaves and the indumentum across this population. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with the integrative approach to species identification and the taxonomic circle, which states that in order for a species to be identified, it needs to be genetically distinct and distinct in two other spheres. For example, you need DNA with morphology and ecological data in order to define a taxa as a separate species. So this study aimed to understand whether the species complex of the three species does in fact contain three distinct species or simply three different growth forms or morphs of the same species that are varying according to diverse environmental pressures and habitats over different altitudinal ranges. So firstly, using morphometric tools to distinguish if the currently recognized species are morphologically distinct and to test whether any morphological um, differences correlate with altitude. We also investigated if the currently recognized taxa are ecologically, geographically, or phenologically isolated by comparing altitudinal ranges, species distribution patterns, evaluating their flowering times to see if they overlap significantly. And lastly, AFLP data was used to see if the taxa form three genetically distinct clusters, and if these clusters match the previously recognized taxon. So starting with morphometrics, with the morphology, a total of 24 traits from 65 herbarium and collected specimens were measured. And we looked at 14 quantitative traits and 10 qualitative traits. But before measuring specimens, all the specimens were sorted into their currently defined species groups based on Hilliard's original descriptions and by comparison to type specimens. Then we went out to go collect leaf tissue. So we collected um, leaf, leaf tissue from five populations throughout South Africa, mainly in the Drakensberg. So we got Senecio seminivius from Sani Pass, from Afriski in Lesotho, and from Mount Orc sources also up there in the Drakensberg on the border of Lesotho. We got Senecio arclifolius from Escort, and Senecio tenacitopsis from Golden Gate National Park. We collected a total of 121 um, tissue samples for molecular analysis, plus a few voucher specimens. So a big question, what did we find? While sorting through the Senecio arclifolius herbarium specimens, we noticed two very distinct morphs across the herbarium samples. One morph matched the type specimen, and the other diverged from the type specimen's morphology that had been labeled as and included amongst the Senecio arclifolius herbarium specimens. So the, individual, the individuals that matched the type specimen were labeled as true Senecio arclifolius, and the secondary morph was labeled as Senecio cf arclifolius, and we treated them as separate and distinct taxon throughout our analyses. So in escort, when we collected what we thought was Senecio arclifolius, we actually collected the secondary morph that did not match the type specimen. And unfortunately, we couldn't make a trip down to the type locality of Senecio arclifolius before the end of the flowering season. But we have recently managed a trip down to the type locality, which is in Renorsterberg in the Eastern Cape, adding a sixth and final population to our data set. So we looked at the distribution of these um, species and we looked at distributions from collected and herbaria uh, specimens. Um, and you can see the three taxa within the Senecio arclifolius complex are distributed across both South Africa and the Sutu, um, but they overlap quite heavily. Senecio arclifolius, which is in yellow, has the most southerly distribution, 
down here in the mountains of the Eastern Cape and Western Cape provinces and is the most widespread species and is relatively isolated from the other taxa. Senecio seminivius and Senecio tenacitopsis, which are in blue and green, occurred mainly in the Drakensberg uh, Alpine Center, including in the Maloti mountain range in Lesotho, and their distributions overlap quite heavily, indicating no geographic isolation between them. Yet it is interesting to note that the Senecio seminivius in blue occurred mainly at, mainly at high altitudes in these regions. And then we have our Senecio CF arcleofolius individuals, which don't really have a very clear distribution pattern, but occur more northerly in uh, the more northern in the Zulu and Zululand. And there's also two outlier individuals. We looked at the flowering times, the phenology of them, and all the flowering times of Senecio seminivius and Senecio tenacitopsis and Senecio arcleofolius all overlap indicating no reproductive isolation based on flowering times. But the Senecio CF arcleofolius times only overlap with um, Senecio arcleofolius for a very small margin. So it's likely that Senecio CF arcleofolius is reproductively isolated. So here we have a PCOA based on the morphometric data and all our high altitude individuals are marked with hollow symbols. And these high altitude individuals do not form a discrete group. The first main cluster contains a mix of Senecio seminivius and Senecio tenacitopsis individuals, and these two groups do not separate out at all and are not morphologically distinct. We had a few strange mixed morph individuals that were in the Senecio seminivius herbarium samples, and we couldn't quite place them. So we called them Senecio CF seminivius. But these specimens do not form part of any species group or cluster, but sit as outliers towards the center of the axes. You can see them over there, um, suggesting that they may be hybrid individuals. Our Senecio CF arcleofolius group groups exclusively in the bottom left quadrant and forms a discrete group. The Senecio arcleofolius also form a relatively neat group over here, but there are two outliers which I have marked. Um, that fall somewhat closer to PC1. But these two outliers are the same outliers that we see in other bits of data, like the phenogram that I have here. So in this phenogram, we can see there are two main clusters, which have labeled as A and B. Within cluster A, Senecio arcleofolius and Senecio CF arcleofolius both form separate groups. Cluster C is fully inclusive of all Senecio CF arcleofolius individuals. Um, however, cluster D comprises, uh, cluster D also comprises exclusively of the Senecio arcleofolius individuals. Um, however, we have these four outlier individuals that sit outside of this cluster. Our second main cluster B is further split into two clusters, E and F, um, and E comprises exclusively of Senecio tenacitopsis individuals. Cluster F contains a mix of the Senecio tenacitopsis, Senecio seminivius, and our strange hybrid um, unknown individuals. And we can see that Senecio seminivius and Senecio tenacitopsis do not form discrete groups and are not morphologically distinct from one another. Again, we have these high altitude individuals which are marked with stars, but they also do not form um, discrete groups or do not group together and are found spread across all the clusters. So we took a further look at altitudinal effects on the morphology, um, and we were particularly interested in the effects of altitude on capitula size, as capitula are often larger at higher altitudes, as seen in other, as, as seen in other Senecianiaes, such as Cineraria, which have larger capitula at higher altitudes. However, we did not observe this in the species complex. We can see a slight trend of an increase in capitular size with altitude, but it was not statistically significant. The only quantitative trait out of 14 traits that altitude had a significant effect on was the distance between leaves, where at higher altitudes, leaves tended to be closer together and therefore growth forms tended to be closer to the ground and more compact. Here we have the PCOA based on AFLP data and three main genetic clusters were recovered. The Senecio seminivius and Senecio tenacitopsis populations once again do not separate out, 
and grouped together in one massive mess on the right hand side here. Um, and these four populations did not separate out from one another and appear not to be genetically distinct from one another. If we take a look at our Senecio CF Archilifolius individuals, which are from Escort, once again, they appear to be distinct from the other taxa. Um, uh, they seem to be genetically distinct from the other Senecio seminivius and Tenacetopsis individuals. And the same is true for Senecio Archilifolius, which is here in the yellow, which also seems to be genetically distinct from Senecio Tenacetopsis and seminivius, and is genetically distinct from the Senecio CF Archilifolius. So going on to the structure graph now, we ran a structure analysis based on our AFLP data, which included 260 polymorphic loci. Um, the six populations represented four main genetic clusters. Each population contained a similar amount of admixed individuals. And the admixed individuals from escort predominantly showed admixture between clusters one and two, which is gray and orange as well as between one and three, which is the blue and orange, this group over here. And then we have our Renosterberg population, which predominantly shows admixture between yellow and blue. The Golden Gate, Sarni Pass, Afriski and Mount Hawk source populations, which are Seminivius and Senecio tenacetopsis individuals, um, all have quite similar profiles, as we can see over here, and mainly show admixture between clusters one and three, which is the gray and blue. So the admixture seen here across these individuals can either be indicative of hybridization or the admixture in, in the entire group across all these, these populations can either be indicative of hybridization or current gene flow occurring between populations or could be due to the retention of ancestral polymorphisms even after multiple speciation events. However, the Senecio CF archilifolius over here is pre-zygotically isolated from the other three taxa as it has different flowering times from these species. Therefore, current gene flow or hybridization is unlikely to be occurring between the Senecio CF archilifolius and the other populations. If we take a look at the Senecio archilifolius in Renosterberg, its distribution was all the way um, south or as a more southerly distribution, and therefore is, it's likely to be geographically isolated from the other populations. So again, gene flow is unlikely to be occurring between the Senecio archilifolius and all the other taxa. So it does appear that our Senecio archilifolius in Renosterberg and our Senecio CF archilifolius in Escort are genetically distinct from one another and are genetically distinct from the other taxon. If we put our attention back onto Senecio seminivius and Senecio tenacetopsis over here, these two lineages, um, uh, within those species, there are two lineages that exist um, and they exhibit clear integration or possibly ancestral polymorphisms. Or this admixture pattern, pattern may even be um, indicative of incipient speciation. So if we refer back to our taxonomic circle now, we can see that Senecio archilifolius is geographically, morphologically, and genetically distinct. So it ticks our requirements to be described as a separate taxon. And our Senecio CF archilifolius, again, is ecologically, morphologically, and genetically distinct. On the other hand, the Senecio tenacetopsis and Senecio seminivius are not distinct in any of these spheres. Um, so in summary, the morphometric, ecological, and molecular results do not support the three currently described species in the Senecio archilifolius complex. The results support the description of a new taxon from among herbarium specimens incorrectly named Senecio archilifolius. The combination and placing of Senecio seminivius in synonym with Senecio tenacetopsis is supported. And then recognition of distinct varieties based on altitudinal and morphological differences um, can be done with these two taxa. And then lastly, the currently um, described Senecio archilifolius sensu strictu is distinct and therefore maintains its species status. Thank you to everyone that helped me, um, everyone that made this project possible, and thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Bianca. Wow, that's an impressive amount of work um, for an honors project and, um, and also amazing, very clear conclusions. Thank you very much.
Um, I've, I've, yeah, I've got some some questions, but let's let's first see um, um, if there's any from the floor. So I don't hog the question space as the chair. Okay, I see everyone's um, writing um, very complimentary comments to you. you. Can read the chat in a little while. Maybe I'll go ahead with my question. Um, so, or, or maybe it's almost a, a comment, really. I mean, I'm just um, to support what what Sandy said about uh, Sandy quoted a, a paper, a 2005 paper, I think, which which talked about the importance of um, herbarium collecting. And there's a, there's another paper um, that I read. I don't have the reference handy, which spoke about the fact that there are so many existing species, undescribed species, that are sitting in herbarium cupboards. And, and it's just amazing that you go and you have a look and suddenly up pops, you know, some formerly undescribed things. And, and also that the that you're not just changing the level at which things are divided, you're actually sort of changing the, the whole pattern with that study. So I, I think that's that's amazing. Um, oh yes, the, the one the one thing I wanted to ask you was about your um, your AFLP, your multivariate analysis on the AFLPs. It yes. looked like you were showing us PC2 and PC3. Yes, so um, we did look at PC1 and PC2 and it had very similar patterns, but there's been a few papers that have supported throwing out um, PC1 because of almost junk data getting stuck in there. So we gave it a go and it looked a lot better than PC1 and PC2 and it didn't change the patterns. Like if I showed you PC1 and PC2, the groups still separate out, but it looked much neater with PC2 and 3, so I just chose to present that. Okay. Okay, interesting. Bianca, can I can I ask a question? Is is um that was fascinating and really really beautiful, beautifully done. If so, that that CF alkylifolius, the new taxon, in the herbarium, was it just from Estcourt or was it from other places as well? Could it have a wider distribution? Yes, it wasn't just from Escort. Escort was where we collected tissue from, but it had mm -hmm. uh, there was a few individuals distributed all more northerly, quite close to Zululand and places further north. Oh, that's so, really cool. Yeah, it wasn't just in escort, it was, it was in a few spots. Oh, thanks. No, that's really interesting. You have to give it a good name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's another question in the chat. Um, Muthama is asking, is there any reason not to adopt a unified species concept where any of the criteria would be sufficient? So uh, maybe Bianca, you might, do you have thoughts on that? We can also throw that question open. I haven't really looked much at the unified species concept. So I don't know if Glynis or Kelsey want to step in and say something about it. It just seemed like a good idea to have multiple pieces of evidence supporting the same thing rather than um, a single piece of evidence to give it stronger support. If I can come on, I'm asking this because at times, especially now flora, which is not into fully studied into detail, we could easily lose species if we just applied a very rigid, rigid criteria for species. Whereas, you know, other data, if you went to uh, full genome sequencing, you might find that those entities actually are separated, even though they are not separated with the marker you're using. We are actually doing sequencing. We're doing Sanger sequencing. I forgot to mention that. Um, uh, see, Glynis has come on now. So maybe she can respond to the unified species concept. So I'm not sure what you mean by unified species concept, Muntaba. It, it's uh, perhaps to we'll drop people in the species concept arena, but uh, Kevin Ducaros eloquently over the last couple of years has argued for using any of the criteria as opposed to Bissale's uh, uh, criteria where you, you need all the four to talk to one another. And, you know, look at Homo sapiens. Uh, is Homo sapiens different from the Netherlands? Even though they have hybridized, there's evidence that, you know, even with some hybridization, you can still recognize species. And so, you know, I, from the results I saw, perhaps what you're picking a signal of hybrid origin of some of the populations. And, you know, it's something for you to put out as you go along, perhaps. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks so much. Good. Yeah, I also wondered about hybrid origin. I know, I know you you do work on polyploids, and I, I suppose that's another another line of, of 
of, of information to look for in your Sunitios? No. Yes, we have, it has been suggested, um, suggested to us to take a look at chromosome counts um, to see if there's differences in there, or if maybe polyploidy could be the reason why we're seeing such high morphological variation within single populations. Um, so it definitely is something that could be a future like add-on research to this. Yeah, okay, well... Bianca, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. And uh, please oh, do thank you around. for having me. <laughs> um, because yeah, there will be also a, um, after Fricky's talk, we can we can have a sort of an open floor as well. Um, but I think we should go on um, now um, to um, Frederick Becker's talk. So um, Frederick is um, currently doing a science internship at the Stellenbosch University Botanical Gardens. And he's going to talk to us today about his MSc work, um, which he did um, on oxalis. And, and interesting enough, um, the, the theme of polyploidy is going to be continued here and morphological investigations. So, um, Fricky, are you ready to? Are you? Oh, sorry, you've got a recording. I think Farnas will. Yeah, will we, we're ready to share. Greetings, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar, and I'm excited to share our findings. This study is not strictly speaking systematic or taxonomy, but it uh, touches on some relevant issues with regards to these two fields. Now, polyploids occur in almost every taxonomic group, and is especially prominent in plants. Even more interestingly, polyploidy, or whole genome duplication, often precedes large lineage diversification events. The angiosperm lineage shows evidence of multiple episodic events of whole genome duplication and is the most diverse plant lineage on the planet today. This leads to the question of just how important polyploidy is in the evolution of lineages. Now polyploids are also very abundant in nature and have a strong correlation with increased invasive potential. For example, almost 70% of weedy grasses are polyploid with similar trends across other families. Many prominent weeds, like Oxalis pescoprae, have been shown to be polyploid. Now, traits associated with the increased invasive potential or weediness may also explain polyploid establishment, persistence, and eventual diversification. Polyploids are often different to their diploid parents in nature. They may show immediate isolation and differentiation from diploids, as seen on this extract, polyploid-induced isolation has a very strong effect across many traits. But the evolutionary significance of polyploidy is complex and the topic of considerable debate. This may in part be, to, be due to mixed evidence observed across various taxa. And in order for us to understand the evolutionary role of whole genome duplication, we need a good understanding of the phenotypic effects induced by polyploidy. Despite different origins, polyploids share some traits of which the most prominent is the Giygas effect. The Giygas effect refers to the enlargement of traits as a direct result of the increase in the amount of DNA per cell. Polyploids are expected to have a low chance of establishment as a viable population, being in the minority that is often outcompeted by diploids. The Giygas effect, however, may bring about advantageous changes which enables polyploids to establish and escape this pressure. It may cause heterosis in polyploid individuals. Larger cells may cause slower growth rates. Slower growth rates may increase a polyploid's nutrient use efficiency. It may also cause a delay in flowering phenology, lowering pollinator competition, and larger flowers may even be more attractive to pollinators. Now, extracts from Porturas et al. in 2019 shows how prominent the effect of the Giygas can be for polyploids. Across a host of traits, the Giygas effect has a very large effect size, with an increase of 25%, and this effect size remains consistent. But whole genome duplication doesn't always lead to the Giygas effect, although the number of cases are in the minority. Now, is this deviation from the Giygas effect something that is only isolated to a few groups? Because if polyploids are reliably larger in general, 
The Geiger's effect could be a useful field indicator of ploidy level without timely and expensive methods like flow cytometry. And this brings us to the study system, Oxalis. Oxalis is a large genus with roughly 500 species globally. The genus is very well represented in the Cape with around 230 known species. It occurs in the species rich um, Cape Floral Kingdom, which has a high species diversity, but very low levels of polyploidization. The Oxalis genus, in contrast, has very high occurrence of polyploids across the genus and within species complexes. Oxalis species vary greatly in size and morphology and habitat, ranging from arid regions to vernal pools, moss heaps and forests. Here is an example of Oxalis flava, a species with a high cytotype diversity, just meaning multiple levels of polyploidy. It has many polyploids and shows incredible morphological variation. If polyploids then show evidence of the Geiger's effect in Oxalis, and this is linked to increased fitness, it could be possible that polyploidy is a driver of this variation. We therefore ask, is there a clear Geiger's effect and signal in Oxalis at, at a higher resolution when we look in the single species in Oxalis purpurea? And is there a correlation between weediness and polyploidy in this genus? So for the first question, we chose to measure pollen diameter, stomata length and cell area, as these have all been previously correlated with the Geiger's effect. We then also predicted that polyploids will show evidence of the Geiger's effect. Now, using the living research collection at the Stellenbosch University Botanical Gardens, we sampled diploids and polyploids for 24 species. All ploidy determinations for this research collection were previously done at the Institute of Botany, Czech Academy of Sciences. Here's just a quick summary of the equipment and software used in the study. Now, Oxalis has a tristylus reproductive system with anthers carried on different whorl lengths. Pollen sizes differ between anther whorls of different lengths. And because of this, we had to sample from a common anther whorl for each diploid polyploid comparison within species. For stomata and epidermal cells, we used the epidermis from sepals as the leaflet epidermis of many Oxalis species comprise of balloon cells, rendering stomata almost invisible and making area measurements inaccurate. All our analyses were done using R, and for analysis, we had three separate response variables, just pollen diameter, stomata length, and epidermal cell area, using these in generalized linear mixed model contexts. The effect size of the Geigers has been shown to be very large, 25%. It remains consistent across traits in most published angiosperm studies. Unexpectedly, however, we found a significant effect for polyploids, but it was very small, lower than 10% for all three of the traits measured. Importantly, as can be seen in these two examples of Oxalis adenodes and ciliaris, we found that the effect is also very inconsistent across traits. There are, these are just two examples, randomly chosen, but this was a commonly observed pattern for our entire data set. So then, Maybe when increasing sampling within a single species across many populations and individuals could give us a more clear pattern of what's going on. If we then sample more extensively and we chose the species Oxalis purpurea, do we find a clearer signal for the Geiger's effect and for which traits? We also, so we measured the same traits as uh, before, adding flower and leaf traits too and predicted that polyploids will show clear evidence of the Geiger's effect. We further asked whether ploidy increases invasive potential and weedy behavior of this known weedy species, Oxalis purpurea. To this end, we measured bulbal production, increase in total bulb weight, and the success of self-pollination for these plants. Oxalis purpurea provides an ideal system to test this. It is widespread and common. The species have multiple ploidy levels and is a known invasive weed locally and globally. 
we did extensive sampling across the species native range. We sampled 12 plants per population for 20 different populations. Bulbs were then planted in a common garden setup and left to acclimate and go dormant. Flow cytometric determinations were done in Prague at the Czech Academy of Sciences, Institute of Botany and at the University of Pretoria, Department of Plant and Soil Sciences. The graph on the screen displays flow cytometry results and cytotype diversity for Oxalis purpurea. Now, distinguishing between ploidy level was problematic with these flow cytometric analysis alone. As you can see, the diploid values are to the left in the red, but higher ploidy level cytotype values occur at a spectrum of tcDNA values. This consequently also potentially indicates separate origins and multiple origins for Oxalis purpurea polyploids which will be discussed later. So based on this, we opted to pool all higher ploidy levels under a single category, polyploid, resulting in a binary data set, including diploids and pooled polyploids. For weediness, we quantified bulbal production and self-pollination success. Bulbs were weighed in 2019 after plants went dormant, and again in 2020 with all their clonal bulbs after dormancy. Self-pollinations were done on the midmorph flowers only, um, as the midmorph is the morph that is uh, most likely to receive its own pollen, and we tried to avoid some morph-related statistical complications. We used principal component analysis to look for any strong correlations between morphometric traits, these are the leaflet and floral measurements, and then used generalized linear mixed models for statistical significance. Now from the PCAs, we can see a very weak correlation between ploidy and petal length and ploidy and leaflet thickness, but there was no real strong pattern to observe. After running the GLMMs for each of the traits, we once again found large variation in significant and effect size. Ploidy is still significant for many of these traits, suggesting that there is a very small Geiger's effect present, but there's a striking inconsistency across effect size response for traits. Here is the martel length distribution for each population. This is the trait that most strongly correlates with ploidy. Now George, highlighted here in the red box, was the only population with a single polyploid sympatrically occurring with diploids. It is also the population with the most clear signal of the Geiger's effect. But perhaps the most interesting result obtained in this study pertained to the measurements of weediness in Oxalis purpurea. Although we found a weak signal for the Geiger's effect in all measured traits, polyploids produced significantly more bulbules than diploids. What is more, the pattern is most pronounced in sympatrically occurring diploids and polyploid populations, highlighted here in red. But not just that. The total bulb weight also differed significantly between diploids and polyploids. So polyploids produce more and better quality bulbs in one season. Interestingly, neither diploids nor polyploids produced seed from selfing experiments, suggesting that polyploidy does not facilitate the breakdown of genetic self incompatibility in Oxalis purpurea. So, Firstly, there was some suggestion of the Geiger's effect being present across the genus and in Oxalis purpurea. In most cases, however, it was very small and remained inconsistent across traits. Clearer patterns in sympatric diploid polyploid populations might suggest a more pronounced Geiger's effect upon formation, which gets masked in subsequent adaptation. But a last thing to consider, and very likely, is that multiple origins of the same cytotype polyploids as shown in the cytotype graph and for pooling of all cytotypes in one group may allow for considerable variation. Cytotypes of different levels may also in fact show very different responses. But polyploids produce more and heavier bulbules in one growing season. This supports current literature, which suggests that polyploids may facilitate and increase invasiveness in species. We did not find overwhelming evidence to suggest a strong Geiger's effect present in Oxalis. Polyploids have a tendency to be larger, but not by much and not consistently so. The Geiger's effect may be temporary, 
being very pronounced in newly formed polyploids and helping in initial establishment, but gets lost due to post whole genome duplication adaptation. What is clear is that we cannot use size as an accurate predictor of whether a plant is polyploid or diploid in Oxalis. This then begs the question, is the Geigers playing a role in maintaining Oxalis polyploids in the Cape? And lastly, we have to consider to increase comparisons between polyploids of the same site type and work to sample more sympatrically occurring diploid po polyploid populations. I would like to thank the following people and institutions for contributing significantly to the success of this project. And here are some um, follow-up references for the talk. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? Thanks very much, Frederick, for a very clear and interesting talk, right? and one that I think you raise as many more hypotheses as you um, as you look at your data as well. Um, so yes, as you said, any are there any questions from the floor? Yeah, uh, hello, Otto. Very nice presentation. Uh, Thank you. I've, we have been working on some grasses, the phylogeny of some grass uh, genus. And here, and most of them are endemic to India. And we have found certain uh, species which are showing a lot of variation in site-specific locus like uh, ITS and RBCL. They are showing a lot of variations. So, uh, and, but we could never find seeds in them. So do you think, uh, 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 we are not sure whether they're new species or the sterile hybrids, or what is your opinion about it? Well, I mean, one would obviously uh, have to consider doing um, cytometric work on the grasses, um, but the chances are there that, well, once again, this is actually quite a um, new research we were doing. There's not a lot of research been done in Oxalis, and I myself has been only recently introduced to um, polyploid literature, but to my mind, it is logical that there should also be some kind of um, isolation mechanism. I mean, that's kind of one of the big things. The moment a polyploid is formed, uh, you get kind of um, uneven un uh, the during gamete fertilization, the alignment of the genes and the chromosomes, in fact, aren't balanced. And often you then get a result of a um, hybrid uh, polyploid which is infertile. And that's definitely something to consider. I and mean, when we don't know the full range of morphological variation introduced by polyploidy, but that's also something then to, to maybe look into further. Thank you so much. So I was just wondering whether we should conclude something based on these ITS or RBCL data or not. What is your opinion about it? Well, I mean, one could obviously consider things separate species, but if, if they can't establish any viable seed, I think there would be a real problem for them to, to um, establish as a viable population and continue to exist as a species. So one should maybe consider what are the alternatives to the variation, even though you get, um, why do you see them um, separating out as different species, but they can't form their own seeds? What, what are the possible explanations for that there? Thank you so much. Oh, guess that sounds like a difficult problem too. I see there's some some talk in some questions in the chat. Um, so um, Glynis and um, was talking about George, and their group has also found sympatric hexaploids and diploids for helichrysum. Odoratissimum in the forests near Nyasna. Um, so the interesting thing here that I might actually expand on is we found a few um, mixed cytotype populations for Oxalis purpurea across its range. These were just not necessarily diploid polyploid mixes. Usually they were tetraploid hexaploid mixes or pentaploid hexaploid mixes. Um, I guess our sampling wasn't thorough enough. I mean, obviously you couldn't get every single plant out there and we kind of targeted specific populations for which previous cytotype determinations have been done. Um, so 
we don't have a full picture of the cytogeographic landscape of polyploids. So there might be more deployed polyploid mixed populations out there. But per chance, the one at George, we sampled a single tetraploid um, in, in that population. Okay, well, Kelsey's following up and saying that area seems to be quite interesting in that George area, ploidy wise. Um, and she was asking, were there any other traits that differed or were variable in that population, that mixed population? Um, very interesting. And this was not the focus of my study, but uh, all the um, easternmost populations of Oxalis purpurea showed a breakdown of the tristyly system, um, where the pollen sizes of the two antherworlds converged to the long antherworld pollen size in, in the species. And the middle pollen anther wall was pushed up all the way to the long morph stigmas, although they were all single morph plants, which was really interesting. We, we kind of uh, went, uh, tried to see what's going on there. Um, yeah, don't know completely. <laughs> okay, there, there's another qu question here from, um, oh, so yeah, Kelsey is asking if you're following up on that. I think Kelsey, is uh, following on from that question, is that right? And she's yes. um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> asking if you're following up on that. Well, Kelsey, maybe you can put the question. Oh, I was just going to ask if you are following up on the, the shift in the reproduction, but the, I'll, and then I see there's other questions there, so I don't want to. Well, I'll quickly, um, quickly answer that. We currently, <laughs> the, the work in Oxalis, uh, apart from phylogenetics, have, have not been extensive. So we're really working on trying to understand the, the tri style system itself for which the genes have not been determined. That's actually the question uh, for my PhD upcoming next year. We're trying to identify the genes that um, encodes for, for tri style inheritance uh, globally in heterostyly, but also in Oxalis. Um, and then once that we can get that going, uh, we can actually really start um, to, to see the mechanism of, of why the tristyly system broke down. Is it an ancestral state or something that happened more recently? But from our results, it's, I don't think it's very strong that polyploid, your whole genome duplication plays any role in this breakdown at all. Hmm. Okay, and then, um, yeah, sorry, Kelsey. Then um, both Promise and Sandy are interested in whether there's, these are allopolyploids or autopolyploids. Um, once again, a very uncertain answer here from my side. Um, previous work done on Oxala suggests that hybridization is very limited or non-existent in the genus in general. Um, so from that, we could infer that it's autopolyploids. But we can't say that for a fact at all, and we have not tested it explicitly. So, so Fricky, I had a, so I think that's really interesting because a lot of these mixed ploidy populations, where you get the mixed ploidy populations, so those are interfertile, so they create hybrids themselves, right? Well, I mean, well, theoretically, we haven't actually yeah. tested um, different sites so of combinations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and the other thing I wanted to ask, I'm just going to be greedy and ask it now, is um. Is, is there any environmental signal to the polyploid populations? Because we have an autopolyploid, Selenium eliagnifolium, which is a hugely invasive weed all over the world, is actually, it has ploidy variation within its mm. native range. And the, uh, the, the weedy version is actually the diploid, which we didn't expect, but oh, the that's weedy is the diploid as opposed to the other ones. But the hexaploid and tetraploids tend to be in slightly wetter environments. So they tend to be, if you look, if you look at the kind of climate layers, you get the you get the the auto polyploid versions yeah. in in you get the mixed populations in slightly wetter areas, which is again not what I would have expected. That's really interesting, and it's a, an important thing to consider. I mean, the different modes by which polyploids form um, could very well have different responses to the plants that that bear those those genomes. But for Oxalis purpurea, um, pretty much the diploid polyploids are intermingled. But there are previous work done on Oxalis obtusa by Kretchikova and, and colleagues in 2013, um, which looked at the cytogeographic um, range of the different cytotypes in the species Oxalis obtusa and found a, a rough correlation there. And then interesting, like, like you said, that's to be expected with the Oxalis um, pescopri weed, 
um, pentaploid cytotypes are only found in invasive ranges. Uh, native ranges doesn't have the pentaploid cytotype whatsoever. Um, but it's, it's really a, a beginning for, for polyploidy work in Oxalis in South Africa, at least. Uh, there's not much done yet. Perhaps if I could spring in here, Nikki, can you? Oh, yes, 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 Kenneth. Um, so, sorry, the question of allo versus auto has been the bane of my life for the last decade. But um, <laughs> one thing that does relate to that, we had a student working on uh, interspecific um, hybrids for another question. Uh, and it turns out that if you stand upside down and uh, talk backwards really fast and do incredibly huge amounts of effort, to get these things to interbreed, then they will form seed. But it is at an unbelievably low rate. So sort of between species um, sharing of genes, given what little information we have, does appear to be fairly low um, in terms of uh, bearing on whether there are potentially um, the, the conditions for the establishment of allopolyploids to start off with. Um, yeah, so I thought that might be of, of interest uh, and of relevance to the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Well, I also think another thing that was really cool about what you showed was that there's possible multiple origins of these polyploid events, because um, one of my colleagues, um, Johannes Vogel, did for his work a long time ago on a splenium across Europe, which has various polyploid um, hybrids, you know, things that are called the same species, but are polyploid, and, and they're actually of, of different origins. They're, they're, they're all polyploid, but they're different auto polyploid origins. So it's kind of, it's really complicated, kind of the whole species thing kind of breaks down no, slightly, absolutely. <laughs> which is always quite exciting. But I think that the, your idea about multiple origins, some of his work might be really interesting to look at, to look at how you might test that, because that's quite cool. No, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. And then there's a question from the chat. I'm just going to go back with, back to from Hendrik. He says, thank you, Fricky, for the great talk. There's been some evidence that the Geiger's effect is very prominent in near polyploids and stabilizes as the polyploid taxon becomes more established. Have you thought about inducing polyploidy in diploids to see if that might be the case here? So that was actually uh, some of the recommendations from our study for, for future work, obviously. I mean, I guess we wanted to start off to see, well, we've got polyploids and the literature says there should be some kind of phenotypic differentiation from diploids. Maybe there's an easy way to tell these apart um, in the wild, is this true? And well, I, at this moment we can say that it's not that, <laughs> that simple. Um, so the next step would obviously be to test, um, to form our own neopolyploids and, and see, do we observe the Geiger's effect and is this something that is then sequentially just diluted due to um, natural adaptation. Another thing that we also have to consider is, I mean, Oxalis is a um, dicotylon plant that forms a bulb, and maybe the Geiger's effect is something that's more pronounced in subterranean organs rather than uh, things, uh, leaves and stuff that appear on an annual basis above ground. But that would be difficult to do because it's quite difficult to, to measure or to at least get clear measurements from, from underground bulb structures doing squashes or, or some kind of thing like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, um, are there any more questions specifically for Fricky on this rather interesting um, guy gas effect in Oxalis? Um, and if not, um, let me just check that I haven't missed any questions from the chat because there was quite a long line of them. I think we've covered all of them. No, you've covered all. Okay. Okay, well then, um, I think I, I just want to briefly thank all three speakers. This has been a really interesting um, session. I think we've gotten into some basically the questions that are troubling all modern biologists and explored a little bit through and around them. Um, so I, I've enjoyed it very much. And I'd like to thank you all very much for your excellent talks. Um, and then I think we can have a sort of an open microphone um, forum. We don't have to keep it up for too long, but if there are any topics that anyone would like to raise or discuss coming out of this session or 
um, more general systematics um, questions. <laughs> yes. 